On this edition of Independent Sources, China's big business in Africa. China sees a, a place like Congo as, as simply an unexplored investment opportunity, a, a nation that needs tons of infrastructure, uh, a nation that has lots of minerals, and it kind of sees a, a, a kind of a win-win opportunity to take advantage of both of those rounds there. And going natural, bad or statement. The beauty politic is what it's pushing. It's not so much a social justice politic that it was really the symbol of in the 60s. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. In the early 1990s, China dipped its toes into Africa by building a huge parliament building in a state-of-the-art soccer stadium in Kinshasa. It was a gift from the people of China to the people of the Congo. Now, that gesture is paying huge dividends as Chinese companies are building everything from roads to housing developments to luxury hotels. The Congo, with its vast mineral riches, provides these companies with all of the raw materials they need and then some. The Chinese influence is spreading across Africa as the U.S. and European presence slowly fades. According to a New York University study, trade between China and Africa has risen from $10 billion in 2000 to $166 billion in 2011, a 16-fold increase. China is now Africa's largest trade partner. China's total aid budget has surged as well from $1.7 billion in 2001 to more than $189 billion in 2011. A substantial chunk of that aid goes to Africa. For decades, NGOs in Western countries have tied aid money and trade to promises for greater transparency among Africa's countries. But China has upended the system. Beijing is known to give aid and sign trade deals with no strings attached. Instead, its priority is to extract commodities at the best possible price, and that in turn has led to the commodities boom which has fueled growth in Africa. Last July, I spent three weeks reporting in Kinshasa, where I interviewed scores of people from the average Congolese to businessmen to government officials. Many felt that despite the benefits to their country, the Chinese have the upper hand in this deal. There are signs that African leaders are pushing back. According to a recent New York Times article, government officials in Niger have fought a Chinese oil giant step by step, painfully undoing parts of a contract they call unfair. In neighboring Chad, they have been even more forceful, shutting down the Chinese and accusing them of gross environmental negligence. In Gabon, they have seized major oil tracks from China, handing them over to the state company. Even with that pushback, it's very evident to most observers that China and Africa's future seem very much entwined. I spoke with Jacob Krishna, the author of the ebook China's Congo Plan, to learn more about this relationship. So Jacob, tell us, I guess, you know, in your book, uh, China's Congo Plan, and your subtitle is What the Economic Superpower Sees in the World's Poorest Nation. Let's start by answering that question. What does China want in the Congo? Well, I think China is looking in the Congo for the same thing it's looking for all around the world, which is business opportunities. Certainly, China as a nation needs minerals, raw minerals to fuel its manufacturing, oil uh, for energy, and, and for the same reasons, petroleum products. But, but even larger than that, Chinese businesses are some of the most competitive ones that are going off and opening mines and doing major construction projects, uh, the likes of which you can see all across Congo and Kinshasa. And so China sees a, a place like Congo as, as simply an unexplored investment opportunity, a, a nation that needs tons of infrastructure, uh, a nation that has lots of minerals, and it kind of sees a, a, a kind of a win-win opportunity to take advantage of both of those rounds there. But is it a win-win? Who's getting more out of this deal? 
That's that's a great question, and that's a question I think um, Congo kind of leaders and leaders all over Africa are, are asking: is is you know how beneficial is this to their country? Certainly, I think it is. You know, like I said, to the Chinese companies, very beneficial. Um, I think the benef how how beneficial will be to the Congolese people really depends on these Congolese uh, the Congolese government and their ability to first collect the tax revenues from these mining deals, for example, and collect enough of them and negotiate good uh, contracts. And second, uh, it'll depend on their ability to distribute that to the Congolese people. And obviously that's that's, a, that's something that's true for any sorts of investment and, and something, a problem that's, that Congo has had for a long time is the ability to take um, the money that it has buried underground, that the value of these resources and actually kind of distribute that in a way that helps the general population more so than just either being wasted away or, or, or enriching, enriching the pockets of, of the leaders themselves. How much is uh, China investing in, in, in real dollars in the Congo and how much are they taking out in terms of in real dollars from the Congo? Well, that's what's that's what's interesting is that the, the investment is now um, in this one particular deal I studied, the, the largest deal in Congo's history, is a $6.5 billion deal. Now, about half of that is going to construct the mine, and a half of that is going in terms of infrastructure projects in Congo, roads, hospitals, that sorts of thing. So the number is $6.5 billion estimated in the in the investment. But um, there is no study, or at least no study that's made public, as to what all these minerals may be worth. Now, of course, it's impossible to tell. 10, 15, 25 years exactly how much they'll be worth, but there are certainly um, companies that, that make quite a lot of money off predicting what those possibilities might be. And Congo's government has says there is no um, um, study that estimates that. Now, private individual studies have estimated the worth of these minerals to be between 40 and $80 billion. Again, that's a $6.5 billion investment. 3.5 billion only worth of public infrastructure the Chinese are building, and an exchange could be, you know, could could in return have 40 to 80 billion dollars worth of uh, minerals there, and then no one knows for sure. And that's kind of the, the biggest problem that so much of this deal, like many such deals, remains uh, largely secret and not in the public eye. When I was in Kinshasa last summer, a lot of people were asking me, "Where is America in all of this? How come the United States is not interested?" and anything to do with the Congo. I mean, at, at least from a, a business standpoint, I know we have a large embassy there, USAID and a lot of NGOs, but what about the business uh, involvement of American companies? Why not any Americans? It's a great question. People ask me the same thing while I was there. I mean, just directly, you know, where are the Americans creating jobs as, as the Chinese are in many cases? Um, and the answer, I think, has uh, a lot to do with um, competitiveness. Chinese companies can do things at a lower cost and have a competitive advantage. But it also has a lot to do with American policy toward Congo, you know. And, I think the, uh, the way we think of a place like Congo is a place to give money to, give aid to. And China doesn't lie. I mean, in, in some ways, the Chinese government sees it that way, too. But in much larger ways, China simply sees it as a smart business investment in a way that um, American companies don't, um, either because of the competitive advantage factor or because also of a lot of legislation we have that makes it difficult to invest in Congo. The U.S. Congress passed an amendment to the Dodd-Frank Act that requires all public U.S. companies to declare where precisely it gets it's, it sources they, they source their minerals from in Congo, um, which is almost impossible to do, and it means a lot of these companies simply have to stop some purchasing minerals from Congolese suppliers altogether. So we we, we have these well-intentioned uh, uh, initiatives here in the United States, but but often they turn out to be more problematic and and really just open the way for for other countries like China to invest more heavily in the area. There was some criticism about the quality of the construction in China uh, by the Chinese in the Congo. Um, is that is that a major concern for the Congolese government? Um, you know, I, I don't know how much of a concern it is to the Congolese government. I mean, certainly you have had these concerns across Africa. There was a hospital, I, I forget if it was in, in Rwanda, that, that collapsed, a Chinese-built hospital, and, and, and there have been concerns that, for example, people will point out that the quality of the road that Chinese build uh, often, you know, a very thin pavement, that sort of thing, in comparison with roads funded by, um, you know, the IMF, World Bank kind of kind of projects. Um, I, I don't know that, that any systematic study has been done of that, but it's certainly a concern that some people have, uh, and hopefully the government shares it and has done the necessary precautions to, to make sure this, this, this infrastructure is made to last. But again, there's really no way to know because the government publishes so little of, of you know, what it does uh, and, and tells us, tells, you know, even its own journalists, Congolese journalists uh, and Congolese legislators even, um, very little of, of what they're up to. So it's hard to know.
So, Jacob, the Congo is not the only place where there's huge Chinese investments going on right now in the continent. Uh, recently, uh, Kenya, where you currently live, uh, the government announced a $5 billion investment from the Chinese. You know, where is this all going with the Chinese you know, in Africa? It's really interesting. I mean, um, more and more, it's, it's, it, I mean, certainly you have investments in oil and minerals, but you're seeing more and more construction. Uh, I mean, the Chinese in Kenya are now investing to um, rebuild or build a new rail line that's going to connect several East African countries, um, you know, which is, which is a, maybe a good investment, but it's also uh, a good investment in the sense that these are countries with a lot of minerals. Uganda, certainly with oil that has not, that for, for more than a decade, companies have been waiting to extract this oil and don't have the method uh, that transport needed to to do it yet and so you have uh, yeah you definitely have the strategic interest um, in terms of where these investments are coming but um you know they're, they're not necessarily showing too many signs of, of stopping or slowing these investments but i think there are signs that the chinese are, are becoming more at least more particular about where they're going to invest how you know and, and that sort of thing um i mean in congo certain chinese uh, bank behind it all, Chinese Exim Bank, has had some concerns about the risk involved with investing so much money in a very unstable country and have kind of tried to step back a little bit from the project. They actually reduced the project from a $9 billion investment to a $6 billion investment. And so I think you see more and more caution on the side of at least the financiers behind all this Chinese investment now. Well, all right. Thank you very much, Jacob. Jacob Kushner, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. When we come back, What's got more people of color going natural? Before that, Abi Shula has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. Bodegas across the city are in hot water after being busted in a WIC voucher scandal. Seeing Tao Daily reports that several bodegas in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan were raided by the U.S. security for allegedly exchanging women, infant, and children vouchers, or WIC, for cash. Some insiders tell Sing Tao Daily that many of the bodegas in Chinatown also allow customers to purchase items with vouchers that are not covered by WIC. Voices of New York reports that members of the Filipino community in New York are having a hard time finding a way to send donations to their homeland. In the aftermath of Typhoon Yolanda that tore through the Philippines, members of the Filipino community are looking to send packages to their loved ones, but the extensive damage has made it impossible. Many are also reluctant to make donations through government agencies because they fear their contributions will be mismanaged. Members of the community are opting to donate to organizations that they know, such as churches. LGBT activists are having some success with their calls for less support for Russia. Members of the gay rights group Queer Nation have protested events held by the New York Stock Exchange and the Russian Center of New York. The group argues that Russia has a terrible human rights record against the LGBT community. Gay City News reports that the activist group calls both organizations to scale back their plans. The NYSC held its event with no Russian flag outside, while the law firm that promised space to the Russian center of New York withdrew its offer days after the event's keynote speaker, American Bar Association President James Silkenot, pulled out of the event. From NYC and Focus, Low-income, middle-aged, and elder straight men in Harlem have become vulnerable to contracting HIV. A 2010 study by the AIDS Community Research Initiative of America finds that elderly men living in housing projects in Harlem are at a high risk of getting HIV because they are lonely. According to the study, loneliness comes as a result of isolation due to racial discrimination and socioeconomic segregation. Statistics show that one in 38 residents in East and Central Harlem is HIV positive, compared to just over one in 100 throughout New York City. The Centers for Disease Control statistics show that these HIV positive seniors are primarily heterosexual. And finally, the history of a famous Jewish deli on the Lower East Side will be documented in a book. Katz's Delicatessen, famous for its pastrami sandwiches, has been in business since 1903 when the Russian Katz family purchased the deli. A new book titled Katz, Autobiography of a Delicatessen, explains its evolution from a neighborhood deli to a tourist attraction. That from the Ford. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. The Afro, a hairstyle both revered and reviled, is once again being sported by slackers 
and scholars alike. The style is just one of the ways men and women of color are deciding to go natural, foregoing the chemicals and hot combs often used to straighten their naturally curlier hair. So is this a fad or a statement of something more? Sarah Pizon will speak with image activist and writer Michaela Angela Davis about whether or not mainstream America is ready to accept those funky froze. Before that, producer Nikki Miller filed this report about why more women of color in particular are deciding to go natural. The true definition is of natural hair is when you're not using any chemicals to change the structure of the hair. And in, in that way, I mean, change the texture. Anu Perstonia is the owner of Kamek Kinks, a natural hair salon in downtown Brooklyn. We have clients who come to us for years who have been natural for years because they've been wearing their hair in braids and twists and locks for many years. And then we have a whole new, a whole new batch of clients who are coming in who want to return to natural. Uh, many of them have had their hair chemically processed since they were children and have no idea what their natural hair is like, what it, how to treat it, what it will feel like, what it will look like. They have no clue about it, so they are on a discovery path about their hair. But that's not always been as easy for black women in particular who've had to contend with what mainstream media deems as beautiful and acceptable. We are in a society that is built on, uh, you know, marketing. And so we are marketed to, to have this long, silky hair that swings and shines and all of that. And our hair is not necessarily uh, that way. Uh, whatever way your hair is, you should be able to work with it and accept it and embrace it. A conversation about natural hair ultimately leads to one of the more prominent styles. Oh, Afro. <laughs> the style was recently celebrated in a lifestyle and coffee table book by Michael July. In the 60s when everybody was trying to have the same shape, round, big Afro, you know, you had to look like the Jackson 5, you know. Today everybody's wearing their hair uh, in a way that's more in tune with them, their texture. Everybody's not trying to look alike. We are slowly but surely learning to accept ourselves fully, uh, accept our, our culture and our Africanness and what that means and embracing it. I'll take my glass off. I'm just going to mess it all up like that. The vivacious June Terry is a natural hair pioneer, the first model to wear an Afro in a print publication. Known as the First Lady, June became a celebrity when she was featured in Ebony magazine. So a lot of people will say, I know who you are, you're the First Lady, you're the First Lady to wear natural. I am not the first person to go natural, but the first one that became famous, let's put it like that. People love to be in style. They don't want to be different. I am different. I am different because I'm myself. I do not follow any other style. This was done professionally. Uh... Though her hair led her to make history in Ebony Magazine, the attention wasn't always positive. I had decided, I said, I think I wanted to work at Martin's. Martin's was another very popular store in Brooklyn. And I went through the interview and everything all right, and then they called me back and they said they could not hire me because my hair was too tall. If I cut it down to about that, they'll be more than happy to have you know, with me. If I had a disease or something, I had to cut my hair. Um, so at the same time, this white lady went past. Remember when they had the beehive, the hair was all piled up on the head? And had she had this thing about 10 feet tall. I said, wait a minute, her hair is tall. Oh, but that's, that's, that's the style. Okay. Mom got closed down two years after that. <laughs> I made sure of that. I said, oh, you, can't, you can't do that to people. Terry is now a fashion designer who works specifically with African fashion and textiles. She says it has less to do with her hair and more to do with embracing her heritage and herself. I'm not insecure about anything. I don't have to worry about whether you like my hair or you don't like my hair. You know, I know who I am. In fact, I had one time a, a, a lady asked me, well, who are you? I said, I am a queen. Oh, she said. <laughs> Stop she was upset, not me. 
because I do feel like a queen. You don't have to have money to feel like somebody. All you need to have the initiative to be yourself and be natural with it. Nikki Miller, Independent Sources. Michaela, thank you for joining us. Sure. So new research shows that natural hair may be a new trend among people who have curly hair. What do you think is behind this? Well, I don't think it's a trend, actually. I, I think we've accelerated a movement that's been going on for a long time. As you saw in the clip, Anu and Comet Kinks have been around for a very long time. And as a matter of fact, in the early 90s, Anu was among um, a group of practitioners that went to Albany to um, petition for natural hair care providers to get licensed because it wasn't something that the industry understood or embraced and salons didn't have um, people who or curriculum or people who knew how to care for natural hair. So there's been activism and policy and politics around natural hair for a long time. However, with the advent of social media and digital media, I think we've had an acceleration within the last five years, you know, with YouTube sensations like Taryn Guy or people being able to share information. It's always been about information, right? And so we've come out of this time of media information being, you know, th particularly through music videos. And that's when we really saw the break happen from people of color wearing more weaves and more um, sort of Eurocentric hair is because the images that they were receiving, the information through images that they were receiving, had this one aesthetic over and over and over and over and over again. And so now, since we have more independent um, media sources, it's been able, we've been able to accelerate this idea of different kinds of ways to wear your hair. So I want to be very careful about calling it trendy because it really is not, um, it's not a trend. It's really just how people's hair is. And well, interestingly enough, in 1994, there was an, a natural hair um, care practitioner, Diane Bailey, who's still working and still creating curriculum. And the New York Times asked her, what are you going to do when the trend is over in 94 about natural hair? And so here we are talking about it. So, you know, it's like hip hop. It's not a trend. But when it comes out, people are like, and it, don't you think it's bizarre that it, like the a radical way you could wear your hair is the way it grows out of your head? <laughs> Naturally, it, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's, but you know our our hair, particularly here in America, is wrapped up in politics, and that's why. Well, let's talk about that. Yeah, this so wearing your hair naturally, right? Is it's it's empowering and it's you know putting forth natural beauty. How do you think that's perceived in the workplace? Well, it depends on the workplace, right? So I think that, you know, people who work in creative spaces or in more kind of liberal or modern, hip um, places, I think that it's much, it's embraced and it's seen as just a style. Because, you know, some people, particularly younger people now, they, they're not attaching, you know, big stories or drama. It's just their hair. And this is the way they think they look cute, you know? Or today, and this is what's so awesome about, um, I think about black hair in particular, it, sh it can shape shift. You know, if you give me 30 minutes and a flat iron, my hair can look like yours, sort of. You know what I mean? Like, so there's this idea that, you know, some people ha enter their natural hair for very different reasons. And I think you have to be clear about the environment that you're going into what, in a work environment. And you're seeing also people who are able to actually shape and maneuver their natural textures into those more sort of corporate desirable shapes mm -hmm. like a chignon or a bun or a center part and still having twists or locks or braids just creating different shapes because I do think particularly the afro triggers um, memories in people it triggers ideas that are political it trigger it locates us as other it locates us as people of African descent. Well, what about corporate America? Is it going to be more embraced? Is it more embraced in men versus women? Is there a difference in the gender? No, I think, I mean, just recently um, at actually an HBCU, a historically black college, um, banned the men from wearing braids and locks in the graduate school, law school in Hampton University. So there's still a lot of feelings around natural hair, men and women, and I think it depends 
which way you're seeing it, like locks trigger things and braids trigger things. And our hair, black hair holds our history. Black hair holds people's hysteria. It triggers guilt. It has all our pride. It has all our pathology. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a resource, right? Mm -hmm. Again, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an instant reminder of who we are. And so sometimes that makes people uncomfortable and sometimes it makes people feel connected. But corporate America, I mean, there's all kinds of codes. It's, you know, there's dress codes. There's how you wear your hair. So I think, um, I think we have to be careful not to get too emotional when it comes to corporate dress codes and work within to kind of help change the culture. Because they say ridiculous things to women, not just about their hair, like don't giggle at a boardroom. Like, you know, in, in a boardroom, so there's there are weird codes inside of corporate culture that our hair just a part of that. Well, what about let's talk about about the political side of the Afro. Do you think that the Afro today still carries a political connotation? N no, I don't. I mean, no. I, I I don't. I think that except for the I mean, there's politics and beauty, right? So the 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 beauty politic is what it's pushing. It's not so much a social justice politic that it was really the symbol of in the 60s. So we have, a di we have different sort of battlegrounds in terms of what we're working through um, politically and what it's interjecting now is this idea of identity, right? And so identity politics are on the table, not civil rights. And so I think that's part of what's getting sort of convoluted in some of the conversations, particularly people from the past generations, they immediately connect an Afro with a civil rights movement. And right now, that's not the fight we're in. But we are in a challenge to self-identify, to say that this is who we say we are today. And, you know, what, what's interesting is that one of the best things about having your hair un treated is it gives you way more options that is the beauty of black hair is that it can you know I can braid it I can twist it I can wear it straight I can wear it like this I can wear it straight and like this all at the same time so what we're doing is starting to open up our possibilities and while we're doing that we other folks have to get comfortable with our with our possibilities and I think that's part of the politic is that there's been an idea of where black Americans are supposed to be and how they're supposed to perform and that they are best when their proximity to whiteness is comfortable, right? So when my hair is straight, my proximity to whiteness is closer than when it's curly. So, the, so those are sort of the triggers that we're kind of having to undo. And the, and the, and the answer is, is repetition. It's like, you know, just seeing more of it. Thank you, Michaela. It's my pleasure. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.